hello and welcome to Where the Road Rises, Law, Lessons and Legacy with me, your host, Eileen Carolyn Walsh, where we connect you with public and private figures, teachers, leaders, experts, authors and artists, guests with a story to tell, wisdom to impart and lessons for us to learn. And indeed, lessons and learning are the wheelhouse of our guest today, Cliff Petrack. I first met Cliff at St. Gerald's back in 2014 and I watched him fascinate the audience with speed math and I knew he would be a great guest for our show. I was not able to make it happen then, but when I met him again at Brother Rice High School in December last year, I decided this time we had to make it happen. So I'm just delighted he's our guest today. Cliff is steeped in math. He got his bachelor's degree in math from DePaul, was awarded a grant from the National Science Foundation for graduate study in math, and taught his beloved subject at Brother Rice High School for 40 years. He is the author of Don't Slow Me Down With That Calculator, your guide to mastering mental math with super shortcut computational strategies, techniques, and methods. You need a degree in math to pronounce it. Well, actually, Cliff considers himself anything but a savant. He describes himself as an average-minded teacher who loves finding and exploring and teaching beautiful math patterns and techniques. So welcome, Cliff. Thank you, Eileen. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm so delighted we finally have you here in the studio. So why don't you start by telling us about your journey and how you come to have this speed math mission? Well, uh, my early years were spent at Brother Rice High School. I was a freshman there the very first year that the school opened up in uh, 1956. Mother Macaulay, right next door, opened up the same year. And um, I got involved in the honors program there for science and math. and. Uh, I kind of thought right from the beginning that I, uh, I, I had a real strong interest in numbers and whatever I did would have to be something dealing with numbers and I figured, well, what better way than to teach it mm -hmm. someday, you know, on the high school level. So um, after four years, I uh, graduated from, DePaul, uh, from Brother Rice and went on to DePaul for four years. And uh, uh, one day, uh, in my senior year, I, I came back, was playing a little basketball in the Brother Rice gym and met up with my former English teacher from Brother Rice, Brother Rowan, who had, had become principal. And he asked me what I had majored in and I told him and he says, what do you plan to do with it? And I said, I'd like to teach math in the high school level. He said, well, where do you think you'd, you're going to be teaching next year when you start out? I said, well, I hear they've got an opening at Evergreen Park High School. He said, Evergreen Park? <laughs> he says, what's wrong with Brother Rice? I said, well, nothing wrong with Brother Rice. I said, but I can't teach at Brother Rice. I said, all of, all of the teachers are brothers, as they were when I was there for my first four years. And he said, oh, well, he said, since you've been away at college, we've started hiring some lay teachers, you know. And he says, you know, he says, if you came in in September and started teaching math, he says, um, you'd have the distinction of being the first former graduate to come back and start teaching with us. So I said, okay. So I did. and. Uh, the rest is history. I uh, was there for 40 years, but something uh, insofar as how this mental math thing came about, that all started one week before my 18th birthday. Uh, I, was, uh, I was going down uh, Wabash Avenue uh, walking with my mother. We came to Crocs and Brentano's bookstore. I started gawking in, my wind uh, in the window and my mother said, I've got a great idea. She says, Next week's your birthday. She said, let's go in here. I'll let you pick out any book you want and that'll be part of your birthday present. Wow, that's great. But I had no books in mind, but I went in and got gravitated to the, to the math section and there was a book that had just been published. They had a big uh, advertising display there and it was this book right here, The Trachtenberg Speed System of Basic Mathematics. And I thought to myself, speed system? And I, I looked through it and it was all arithmetic. I said, well, I know my arithmetic. How, how can arithmetic get any faster than what I've learned during my eight years, especially in grammar school? So I was so curious. I said, Mom, I'm going to take this book right here. So she said, fine. So I read the book, and when I got to the end of it, there were two things I did. 
first thing I did was to pick my jaw up off the ground because I was in such awe of what I had read. I, I'd never heard of any of this stuff before. And then the second thing I did, I went right back to page one and I started rereading the book only this time. I had my notebook here and I'm starting to take copious notes because uh, there's no way you can, you can learn this kind of stuff in one reading. Uh, uh, as you'll find out today when we get into some examples later on, uh, takes a lot of time and, and practice. Uh, so um, what would happen over the next 40 years, I was teaching algebra, geometry, analytic geometry, and the rest of the subjects, and uh, I would throw in a little bit of mental math now and then. Now, running ahead in the story a little bit, in 2004, uh, 2005, I wrote the book. The book was finished, but I didn't have a title for it. And I started thinking, gee, what am I going to call it? I wanted something that would catch somebody's eyes and ears, you know. And I remembered something that had happened to me in 1991 in the classroom. The bell rings at 3 o'clock. It was a freshman class. The kids all go running out, except for one kid who comes up to me with his book open and he says, could you show me how to do this problem right here? It was a word problem. I said, yeah, sure. So I got out the paper and I'm starting to explain it. And it was some word problem dealing with area. And, and, at one, and he's listening very attentively. He's standing right next to me. And I said, uh, I said, now the first thing we have to do is get rid of these parentheses. So we're going to have to multiply 85 times 85. And wow. Before I could say another word, this kid who really wanted to help out a little bit, he, he quickly he quickly says, oh, wait a second, wait a second, I, I, I think I've got my calculator with me. And I just put out my hand, I says, son, I says, don't slow me down with that calculator, it's 7,225. And he was in amazement, he said, how did you know that? And so having a little fun with him, I said, well, gee, I've got the squares of all my two-digit numbers memorized, don't you? And he said, well, no, no, I, I don't. I said, well, you really should. Well, eventually I let him know that there's a quick way of squaring a two-digit number that ends in five. Uh, and, and combined with that, uh, another thing that happened was um, in 1995, about 10 years before I retired, uh, I began to speak at math conferences. And I found out that when you speak at a math conference, you're expected to hand out like a two-page flyer to your audience members so they get a little idea of what you're all about. And I did that. That was 1995, like, like maybe two pages stapled together. By 2003, I had a chance to go up to uh, uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada and give a presentation up there. And this is all that I have left. This is my handout. This is exactly 30 pages long. And when I came back home, I said, oh my goodness, I said, this is not a handout. This is a book, or at least the start of a book. And so I decided to title the book, Don't Slow Me Down With That Calculator, the very words that I had blurted out to that student. So um, that was the start, and uh, it's been fun. I've, I've had a chance to do all sorts of presentations all over uh, uh, East and West Coast and uh, all sorts of libraries and schools. So it's fun, and like I'm that. still doing it. I, I still enjoy it. So mm -hmm. I, I think, uh, as I told you before the show, I, I believe this is my 148th so-called presentation, but first one on TV. Oh, well, we're delighted to have you on TV and that you get to reach our lovely audience. Before we get to your objectives and indeed the techniques, can anyone learn math? And why do you think so many of us feel a barrier with math and that maybe we're enumerate? Uh, or can, is, is that a mental barrier? Now, you were obviously born for math, so we may not all dive deep at your level, but are we all capable of learning math? Well, I suppose that's something that'll be debated for a long time. I, I think you can. I, I think the problem starts very early with the basics. And by basics, I mean, well, here, think of it this way. Think of all the homework problems you were ever given in math at any level whatsoever, from first grade up through college. I don't think there was one problem that you ever had to do that didn't involve some computation. You either had to add some numbers, subtract them, multiply them, square them, whatever. And so you've got to learn your basic number facts. And I think that 
some of the kids think there's some sort of a shortcut, maybe because of the advent of the calculator, which came in roughly around 1970 or so, the handheld ca ca calculator. Uh, and some of these kids looking for a shortcut uh, thought, well, hey, I don't have to uh, memorize that 7 times 9 to 63. I'll just use my little calculator here. Um, but no, I if I was teaching in the lower grades and I never had a chance to do that, um, I, I would really stress learning the basic number facts. And there's a lot of ways of doing it. Um, in my own case, the nuns I had said, go home and memorize the multiples of five, the multiples of six, whatever, <laughs> whatever it might be. And I did. It was easy for me. But for some kids, I know it's not easy. So some people need, uh, you know, whether it's in the classroom at home, something like a a uh, flash card, you know, with the, with the answer on the back for mom or dad, just in case mom or dad has some yeah. problems, you know. <laughs> and, and these work fine. And nowadays, with the advent of uh, uh, computers, there's all sorts of websites where, where the kids can uh, log in and uh, do all sorts of exercises. And I might also say that when I went up to Alberta, Canada, another funny thing happened, not funny thing, a great thing happened to me up there. Uh, uh, there was a, an area where vendors were selling their wares and there was one, a, one vendor's table where there's a big flock of people around it and I went over there, well, what's going on over there? Well, I met the man that was giving the presentation and selling his wares and he was a fellow from Jackson, y, uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming and he had invented something. He had invented, invented this thing called the Flashmaster and um, I got to talk to him. He gave me this one for free. And, and I happened to mention to him at the time, I said, well, yeah, I give presentations on mental math. He said, well, maybe you could mention my flash master now and then. <laughs> so I've done that. I don't know how many of these I've ever sold on his behalf, you know. But uh, anyway, I, he still is selling them. They, they sell for around $56. You just uh, dial up mm -hmm. uh, flashmaster.com, I guess. So, um, so let's get to the mental math. What are your objectives and are there any prerequisites to be able to apply your methods? Yeah, uh, let, let's take a look at objectives. I feel there's four objectives because, like I said, uh, we're talking about computations. And again, I don't care if you're talking multiplication, addition, whatever. First and foremost, we want to get the correct answer. If we don't get the correct answer, it's a waste of time. So that's our first objective. But let's suppose you and I were doing a problem, the same problem. Let's suppose you and I were doing, um, uh, let's suppose somebody wanted us to multiply 29 times 31. And you've got your paper and pencil there. I've got paper and pencil here, if, if I care to use it. But in any case, whichever method you use, you get an answer of 899. I get an answer of 899. Well, it turns out we're both right. Fantastic. Looks like we're equal right now. All right, but let's, let's suppose, uh, besides getting the right answer, what if we looked at how long it took you to get 899, how long it took me to get 899? Uh, I would have gotten it probably in about three to four seconds. And how long it would have taken you probably would have been a little bit longer. You probably would have used a, uh, one of our methods of multiplication that have been taught in textbooks for years. Uh, so that's the second thing. Let's get the problem done as quickly as possible because chances are there's more problems that we're going to have to be doing after that one. Uh, just like baking a pie. Uh, uh -huh. I mean, you might enjoy baking a pie, but uh, why spend forever on it? Let's mm -hmm. move it right along as long as you know what the steps are. The third objective is let's get the problem done with as little writing as possible. Now, 29 times 31, you know, you'd probably put down the two numbers, you draw the line, you get those two other lines, now you've got to add the columns. Well, that business of that third and fourth lines there where you have to add the columns, total waste of time. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to write the answer down. And a fourth objective is, if at all possible, don't even need a pencil. Let's, let's orally come out with the answer of 899 and um, see how that works. So those, those are my four objectives. Let's get the right answer. Let's get it done as quickly as possible with as little paper and pencil as necessary. And whenever possible, no paper or pencil at all. Uh, and, um, and oh, and you were saying uh, 
the, than the prerequisites. Prerequis and those are some noble objectives. Uh, prerequisites, uh, actually, I can, I can limit it to three, three very important ones. Uh, f the first one I've mentioned already, you've got to learn your basic number facts. I if you're a student who buys my book, for example, uh, thinking, okay, there's 62 shortcuts in there, boy, I'm going to read the book and I'm going to be able to fly through my problems. Well, maybe you will be able to if you know your basic number facts. But if you're a person who, uh, on the first line of something, for step one, if you have to multiply seven times nine, and, and you say seven times nine, um, seven times nine. Fourteen, uh, twenty-one, twenty. <laughs> Sometimes they'll answer it with a question. Sixty-three? Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, you've got to be able to mm -hmm. come right out with that correct answer right away. Uh, now, once you've done that, then the next thing you have to do is you have to get your hands on preferably a book, preferably my book, but if not my book, then somebody's book that incorporates a lot of mental math methods. Um, because you're not going to find them in your current textbooks. Not in the United States. You will in Asia and Europe, but not here. Oh. Uh, and that's a shame. I mean, if I were trying to sell my book in, in Asia or Europe and said, hey, hey, gang, look at this, 62 shortcut methods, they wouldn't be interested in it. They'd say, why do we need that? We've got those. We probably have all those 62 methods in our current textbooks as we go from first grade to eighth. Uh, and uh, they're right, but in our country, it's the other way around. They're, they're not in our textbooks. Could, could we just stop there, yeah. Cliff, and tell us a little bit about that? So you taught math for 40 years, and you would have taught the standard curriculum. You would have put in a little bit of mental math here and there, as you said. So why do we have the fundamental difference? And why do you think we are continuing to teach traditional methods if there are better methods and if other countries who are maybe beating us when it comes to computation and engineering, why, well, why are we behind? Yeah, that's a great question, Eileen, and I wish I had a good answer for you. I thought we were doing things well and we're teaching the fundamentals well up until around the time of the handheld calculator where all the kids all of a sudden said, hey, I don't need a calculator anymore. Uh, I've got, I mean, I don't need yes. uh, to memorize anymore. I've got my calculator right here. And um, they were looking for shortcuts in that area, and it, it just didn't work. And fortunately for the people in Asia and Europe, um, it, it worked out for them. I, I, I don't know what they did with their teaching methods, but they convinced the kids to learn the shortcut methods, and, and they've been beating us ever since. You know, every year there's a mental math competition for eighth graders in the world. And the developed countries of the world, which for whatever reason this past year numbered uh, 30, uh, 34, uh, competed. Everything is mental math. Uh, can't work out. Everything has to be done in your head and then just write down the answers. Uh, this year we finished 27th out of 34 countries. And, you know, if, if you were a baseball team, you'd probably say, oh, well, we just had a bad year. No. It's like this all the time, unfortunately. Uh -huh. We're always in the bottom third. And, and again, it's because the kids that compete for these other countries, they learn these mental math methods right from the beginning, right from grade one, all the way up to the time that they're doing their competing. Whereas in the U.S., the good kids that we send over there, they've never heard of mental math until maybe the sixth grade or so, and then they'll you know, some teacher in charge will say, Eileen, I think you'd be perfect for our team of mental math uh, people when you get into the eighth grade. I know you're only in the sixth grade now, but we've got two years to work with you and try to teach you as much as we can. And you're going you're gonna to learn a lot and you're going to do your best, but you, you're competing against people that have been studying the same material for the past six years or so. Mm. So that's where the problem comes in. So it, it makes it difficult. So I don't know when we're going to catch up until we start getting these uh, mental math methods. But at least we have you here today to teach us and our audience uh, a few examples of how this mental math works. So why don't you just well, take it away? Uh, that would be Claire. fantastic. I've been uh, waiting for this opportunity. Now, one thing I should say at the beginning is there's no way that I can teach you mental math in whatever we have, 10 minutes or so. Uh, uh, best I can hope to do is hopefully whet your appetite uh, for what can be accomplished. Now, um, one thing that's special about my book, uh, I did two things. Uh, I wrote the book because I wanted to do away with these 30-page uh, handouts, 
And secondly, of all the books that I've written on, or read on mental math, which numbers around 55, I wasn't able to find even one where the authors went out of their way to teach the, the reasons why the shortcut methods work. The proofs, uh, the, we'd call them proofs or derivations of the methods. So I said, mine's going to become the first book, at least in this country, that's going to back up all of the mental math methods with proofs. So I just wanted to show you at the beginning uh, what, a me uh, what a mental math proof looks like. Now, let's pretend we have to, mul well, we're dealing with the multiplication of three digit integers less than 120. If you get beyond 120, you run into some problems, which you'll see in a second. So let's suppose we had 102 times 107. Uh, not too bad a, a problem to do the long way, but believe it or not, we, I can write down the answer immediately, and I don't have the answers memorized, but all I'm going to do, I'm going to say the answer to this problem is 10914. Now you say, how'd you get that so quickly? Here's what I did. Step one, both numbers begin with a one, and the overall numbers are less than 120. So that tells me to put a one right here. To determine what I put in the next two slots, all I do is I take these two numbers, two and seven, and I add them. Two and seven give me nine, which I write as zero nine. Then for the last two slots, I take the same two numbers, two and seven, but I multiply them. 1, 4, that's the answer. So for the next problem, I'm going to put down a 1, then I'll add 6 and 8, then I'll multiply 6 times 8. Now, anybody seeing that is going to say, wait a second, that looks like some sort of a magic trick. <laughs> why, would you, why would you perform those three steps? Uh, you know, it doesn't seem to make any sense. Well, you're right, it doesn't seem to make any sense until you try to derive a formula for this. Basically what we're doing is we're multiplying two numbers, 100 plus x times 100 plus y. You perform the algebraic multiplication, it comes down to this third step which tells you that the, that the answer to the, this problem, this problem, or any other problem that fits these conditions is going to start out with 10,000. Now here's our five slots. It's going to start out with 10,000 plus how many hundreds? X plus Y number of hundreds. That's just what we did up here. Two plus seven is nine. So uh, it's going to be zero nine hundred. And what about the units in the tens? Well, plus X times Y. Two times seven is 14. So if we had 109 times 111, Eileen, the first number is a... No, don't test me on live <laughs> TV. <laughs> Okay, it's a one, and just like we did up here. And then we're going to take the two numbers, the nine and the 11, and we're going to add them. Whoops, I'm sorry, 11 and nine give us a 20. And then we're going to multiply 11 times nine to give us 99. Of course, somebody might say, well, what happens if you add the two numbers and it comes out to over 100? Well, then you'd have to carry a one over, make this a two. Or what would happen if... The two numbers that you're multiplying turn out to be more than 100. Well, again, you'd have to carry over onto this third slot. Um, but anyway, that just gives you a rough idea of what a, a derivation or a proof looks okay. like. But I did start out a little bit tough here with three-digit multiplication. Let's get to something a little bit easier. Straight multiplication. Now, oh, I could use a little bit of this. Now, in the United States, with our math textbooks, the three most popular methods for teaching two-digit multiplication, such as 12 times 25, I show you two of them right here. This is what I learned by. 5 times 2 is 10, write down to 0, carry a 1, 5 times 1 is 5, the 1 you carry is 6, 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times 1 is 2, add the numbers, 300. Okay. Then some people said, well, you know, some of, the, some of our students don't understand. It, it looks like you're sort of sliding over to 24. Well, you're really not. It's really 240. It's just that you're not bothering writing in the zero. But in any case, to make things easier, so they say, they said, let's, let's put in all these numbers. 5 times 2, that's 10. 5 times 50 is 50. And then 2, 
uh, or I should say 20 times 2 is 40, and 20 times 10 is 200. Add these numbers up, and again, you get 300. Maybe the kids understand this a little bit better, but it's a lot more writing. Remember what our objectives are. So then with Common Core, oh, here's what your kids are coming home with now. Hey, let's look what the teacher told us to do now. For 12 times 25, we make this box, we draw these lines, we put into two numbers, 12 and 25. 2 times 2 is 0, 4. 2 times 1 is 0, 2. 5 times 2 is 1, 0. And 5 times 1 is 0, 5. Then you add up these numbers, and the answer is, reads this way, 0, 3, 0, 0. Now, how many U.S. scientists and mathematicians and engineers do you think multiply 12 times 25 by doing this? And how many students do you think that do their multiplication this way are ever going to make the United States a little bit higher in the standings with the mental math competition? I don't think so. However, there's a fourth method. My method, and not just mine, but others that have come before me, but certainly uh, one that you won't find in the U.S. textbooks. All right, let's see it. The mental math method, 12 times 25, you just put down 300, zero, zero, you're finished. Now you might say, well, wait a second, that's easy to say, but how do I know that I should put a zero here and then a zero and then a three? Good question. Okay, here's the method. Okay, we're multiplying a couple of two-digit numbers. Three steps. The first step, and we, we go from right to left, we multiply the two units digits. So in this problem right here, we'd multiply three times two to give us a six. Then you take the sum of the cross products. You multiply these two numbers, you multiply these two numbers and add them together. So three times one is three, two times three is six, three and six give us nine. And finally, the third step, you multiply, in other words, you find a product of the tens digits, the three and the one. 396. So for this one here, 1 times 2 is 2. Multiply, that's 4. That also is 4. That gives us an 8. 4 times 2 is 8. We're finished. 2 times 5 is 10. Write the 0. Carry a 1. Here's 4. And 15 is 19. And the 1 we carry is 20. Write down to 0. Carry a 2. 2 times 3 is 6. And the 2 we carry is 8. Finally, 3 times 4 is 12. Carry a 1. Uh, here's 21. And 8 is 29, and the 1 we carry is 30. Write down to 0, carry a 3. 7 times 2 is 14, and 3 is 17, and we're finished. So um, notice what you've done. You've got the, prob you got the right answers, I hope. And uh, we got it in a very small amount of time uh, with virtually no writing except to write the answers down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, let's jump to addition which we all feel we're probably pretty good at. But there's still some shortcuts that you can use when you're adding columns of numbers. If I was adding this column of numbers, uh, what you would hear me say is 13, 18, 28, 30, 46, 51, 58. Or for this one here, you'd see 7, 17, 20, 33, 38, 48, 50, 61. So this one here is 61, and this one's 58. Now. The most important uh, element of getting the answer correct and uh, fast is by uh, knowing your basic number facts, okay? Must know your basic number facts. I can't be saying, let's see, 6 and 7, 6 and 7, um, 13, no, that's not going to work. We've really got to get good at that. Another thing, okay, we've got 13, 18, now I'm at 18 right here. My subtotal is 18, and my eyes scan the next two numbers. They add up to 10. Anytime the next two numbers add up to 10, I jump right away. It's just like taking two steps at a time when you're going up a flight of steps. So I say to myself, 18, 28. Of course, I don't write it down. I'm just thinking it. And with the two, that makes 30. Now, that's another great number to work with. It's a multiple of 10. I'm going to add the next two numbers again. 7 and 9 is 16. 30 added to 16, that's 46. So I'm up to 46, plus 5 is 51, plus 7 is 58. So um, there's about four little shortcuts that I showed you there. Uh, the most important one, again, know your basic number facts. Yeah, that's a recurring theme. And maybe we'll have one more sample. 
Okay, okay. Um, here's one. A lot of people have difficulty subtracting a number from 100, okay? And different people are taught different methods, and some are bad, some are so-so. The best one that I could recommend is what I call the 9-10 rule. All you do, if you want to subtract 62 from 100, for example, you just subtract the first number from 9, subtract the second number from 10. So 62 from 100 is 38. Or just one more, let's do 71. 7 from 9 is 2, 1 from 10 is 9. We're finished. And uh, I'll just mention, without doing any of these, I was going to do a little bit more subtraction, but the point is, if I have a three-step method for subtraction, and if you use that three-step method, I guarantee that you'll be do doing problems like this in the same number of seconds as the number of digits in your answer. So for this problem here, there's going to be two digits in your answer. You should be able to do it in two seconds. This has uh, nine digits in the answer. You should be able to get it in nine seconds. So, but I, I do subtraction a little differently, and um, I think you'd like it. And th this Let's was the very it. last thing I was going to give you on fractions. Kids don't like fractions. You have to find the least common denominator when the two fractions are different. No, you don't. It's a waste of time. All you have to do is use what I call my smiling X method. You know the answer is going to be a fraction. Let's multiply these two. 6 and 7, that's 13. Let's put a little smile on the 3 and the 7 to indicate multiplication. 21. We're finished. 13, 21st. Um, so we, we never even had to find the least common denominator. So that just gives you a rough idea yeah. of some of the things that can be done with uh, mental math. There's so, so much more. Uh, but um, It occurs to me as you go through those samples so beautifully and efficiently. And if you don't mean, mind my sharing with the audience, you're almost 80 years now, Cliff. And you're clearly still mentally agile. So do you believe there's a secret to mental agility by uh, keeping your mind alert, by learning some of these techniques? And can they be applied beyond school and college? Is this something all of us should pay more attention to? Uh, yeah, I, I think you've hit on something there. Um, you know, as we grow older, you'll find this out in about 40 years, but the body doesn't work quite as well as it used to. I played semi-pro baseball for years and years. I bowled a lot. I skied, did all sorts of good bicycling. I bicycled from Seattle down to San Diego, Canada, Chicago, etc. I'd love to do those things again today, but the body won't let me. Um, uh, but you have to do other things. I work in the garden an awful lot. I, I try to keep busy. Uh, I became a dance host on cruise ships. Uh, that means that you've got to be single and you have to pass the test and dance. You have to be at least 50 years old. And most important, you have to dance with all the single females who need a partner. I figure it's dirty work, but somebody's got to do it, you know. Oh. So I, I did that for a number of years and I could still do it again. The COVID has slowed us down a little bit yeah. with that. So uh, uh, you got to stay busy. Uh, and I do an awful lot of dancing, uh, even not on a cruise ship. So uh, yeah, I go up to Clear Lake, Iowa, where Buddy Holly was, uh, uh, did his last performance back in 1959. They have a big rock and roll extravaganza yeah. up there. And I get into the dance contest over there and was able to win it. Uh, finished third a couple of times and finished first uh, year before last. So. Well, that's interesting. And as we become a little more philosophical about you and your life and, and less about the math, I'm wondering what you have learned, what your life lessons have been. Maybe first from all those years teaching students, do you think, and you still teach summer camps in mental math. Yes. So you're still seeing our millennials and our Gen Zers. So how are we doing? I mean, do you have faith in the generations coming forward, our future leaders? Well, I, I, if I could stay with these same kids <laughs> for eight years, <laughs> um, I, I, I'm just hoping like anything that our, our textbooks will change a little bit. I mean, I'm sure we got good teachers out there. Unfortunately, the, our good teachers out there are not teaching this because in fairness to them, they don't know anything about this. I wouldn't have known anything about this if I hadn't gotten this, this book when I was 18 years old. But I think if, if our teachers today are exposed to some of this mental math, they're going to love it and they'll pass it on to the kids. They'll do just fine with it. Um, 
And it, the other thing, you just have to keep yourself busy uh, with whatever your likes are in life. Uh, yeah. Keep moving. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I once said that uh, I, I think the epitaph for my tombstone someday is, it's tough to hit a moving target. Ah. So you got to you got to continue to be a moving target, uh, or at least continue moving anyway. So let me ask you this: So you have written and published a book, and many of our audience, and and me included, I've I've written two programs, but there is a book that I'm I'm writing at the moment, and and finding the time to write, to hone, to focus, to concentrate, to research is so hard. And it's not just time, it's also the focus and, and keeping one's bottom in the seat. So how was the book writing process? How did you discipline yourself? What was your method? Well, you're right. I mean, uh, sometimes you're just so up for writing, um, you put everything else aside, but then you hit these blank areas where I didn't want anything to do with it for a while, so I put it off for a week or whatever it would be uh, uh, before coming back to it. That is a very difficult thing. I think it's a difficult thing for all authors. Um, I, I've written two other books on baseball coaching. Um, uh, well, I'm not writing a book now, so I'm not up to any of those problems right now. But um, no, I think if you just stay with it, that, that urge to write is going to come back. And boy, when it hits you at whatever day, whatever hour it is, <laughs> even go, if it's 4 a.m., <laughs> put everything else aside and get yeah. to that right away. Lovely, lovely. And if someone would like to purchase your book, would like to know more about what you do, have you teach, speak uh, to their club, what is the best way to get a hold of you, Cliff? Well, the first thing I would uh, recommend, um, first of all, it, uh, every year, this year will be my 16th year this summer during the third week of June. It's always the third week of June from 9 until 10.15, Monday through Friday. This year it's June 13th to 17th at Brother Ice. I teach a mental math class five days. I try to get in as much as I can. Um, uh, it's for boys or girls going into the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, or even ninth grades. And uh, we have a good time, um, and it's fun to interact with the younger ones because I taught on the high school level, so it's a little different for me. But I've been doing that now for 16 straight years. So if you're interested <coughs> in having some child that uh, you have in your family, take the course. All they have to do is either go to the Brother Rice website, look for their summer camps. Incidentally, my, my course is called Summer Math Camp. I don't know why, but so many of their courses are camps, so summer math camp, but it's the only math course offered during the summer, so that's mine. Uh, or contact the, uh, uh, the switchboard at Brother Rice and they can give you more information. Uh, outside of that, if you have a question about mental math that you'd like to ask me, if you'd like to purchase a copy of my book, if you'd like to book me for some presentation someplace, um, feel free. I think I quickly jotted the my contact information, web, uh, my number is cptrack1 at hotmail.com. Okay, cptrack1. So that's to either buy a book, arrange a presentation, ask a mental math question, or information about the mini course. Uh, and so maybe I'll see some of our listeners uh, this summer. Absolutely. And isn't he quite the teacher coming so well prepared? I love it. Why don't we end with maybe some closing words? Do you have a favorite? Yeah, well, you, you, yeah I, I'll tell you what, um, I've got something right here. In fact, uh, I've done a lot of things in life, a lot of fun things besides math, but when it comes to math, um, I think it can be sort of summed up in this math cartoon that I found in the paper many years ago, and I would be the second person speaking. There's two fellows, they look like uh, they're in the Foreign Legion, and they're guarding a turret in some castle. And the first fellow says to the second, he said, uh, did you ever take a date to a drive-in movie in high school? And the second fellow, myself, I guess, said, well, yeah, once, but she went to the concession stand and never came back. <laughs> and, the first guy, and the first guy says, well, did you ever wonder why? And I said, well, yeah, but I kept on doing my math homework. Oh, <laughs> oh Cliff, I think that's some That's the story of my life. 
and we are all the beneficiaries of uh, that life and math. It's just been wonderful to speak to you. It's been lovely having the audience learn about speed math and how they can find out more about it. And maybe you'll come back sometime and tell us a little bit more. Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, real quick, besides the book, I also sell the book on a thumb drive. So um, it's half the price or so, but we'll talk about that yeah, on the phone. We're in the electronic world now here as well. <laughs> So we will wrap it up there. Thank you viewers for watching. You know how to get a hold of Cliff if you want more information. And do stay tuned in the coming months. I have a politician to inform and inspire you. I have a doctor who's going to be the guest on our next show. And we also have a lawyer who's going to tell you more about election law. And that's going to be June when we have our elections coming up at that time. So lots coming up for you. Thanks for watching. I will see you next time on Where the Rose Rises. Thanks and bye.